Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Thanks to Siti Alda Ibrahim for the recitation of the Holy Quran The third agenda is singing the song of Indonesia Raya and Mar Sang Surya For all audience, please arise
For all audience, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, entering the speech that will be delivered by the head of the Department of English Education to Mr. Titi Setiabudi, SSMA, please come to the stage. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh <coughs> Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah di hadana li hada wa lakuna ala nahtatiya lawla an hadana Allah Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa hadahu la syarika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammad dan amadu wa rasuluh Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ala muhammad Rabbi surahli sadari wa yasirli amri Wa ahlul uqtatam lisna yifkau kauli Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Prof. Rokib Khouduri. Uh, this is very great morning. This is very great day because we have Prof. Rakib with us to give uh, his knowledge, his insight, sharing with us. Uh, this visiting professor program in Stadium General. Uh, is held by some department, our English department for, in, it is held by collaboration of undergraduate and graduate department of English education and it is also supported by PKOE, uh, international officer of OMS uh, and in this morning Pak Gunawan has been with us, uh, he will open this this program uh, in this morning. <clears throat> and thank you for the committee, for the student who have been here. Uh, I'm very happy to have you in here. It is there are maybe around 200 students uh, attending or joining in this program, uh, Prof. Rakib. <clears throat> uh, Prof. Rakib visiting our university, it is his first time attending this university, but hopefully it is not the last. We will continue with our collaboration and another program. Um, the name of Rakib Khaudhuri is not, is not, what is it, it's not strange, uh, it's not it is very familiar name in our culture, Mr. Rakib. We know uh, in Indonesia there is Imam Khaudhuri, uh, Muhammad Khaudhuri, Ahsan Khaudhuri, and another name with Khaudhuri. Uh, and Rakib is also very popular with us. Rakib is one of the angel, one of the malaikat, Rakib and Atid, who are with, who are with us every day. Uh, the Malakat will note our will note our our cheat, our good cheat and every everything we do, everything we do every day. And now Mr. Rakib uh, with us, he will not uh, what is it, write your cheat or conduct, but uh, he will open his note and sharing with you with us in this occasion. Uh, that is the Rakib. Meanwhile, Hoduri, this is Arabic, uh, Arabic word. It is from, if I'm not mistaken, from Kho, Dhod, and Ro. One of the meaning of this word is green, uh, green color. And when we sang, sang Surya, uh, there is word warna hijau berseri, warna hijau berseri. Hijau is green. <clears throat> uh, so the meaning of Rakib Hauduri is an angel who has green color. Green color is one of uh, favorite color of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
and in in hadith it is also said that the muslim who uh, entering jannah surga uh, firdaus they will wear green cloth they will wear green cloth so mr rahib khawtori is the angel who has green green cloth yeah but now you you wear blue cloth yeah okay it doesn't matter <coughs> Okay, uh, and hopefully the objective of this program will be will be will be get the beneficial uh, sharing the knowledge from for the student. It's on. It is not only a knowledge, I think, but uh, you can get the insight. You can get the spirit of Prof. Rahib when. Uh, he is sharing with you the knowledge, the experience, the great achievement of, of him. So, uh, for this morning until afternoon and uh, for tomorrow meeting, I hope you enjoy this, this meeting, this program, this economic program for students. Uh, because, and we also, I would like to say thank you for the lecturers because um, what to say? They they ask the student to come here, uh, replacing the class and joining in this in this morning program. I am very thankful for for the lecturers who who what is it? Who permitted the student to join in this in this occasion? So I think that's all from me. Uh, once again, thank you for all, Prof. Rahib, for joining us in here in this morning. Hopefully, it will be very great day. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Mr. Titi Setiabudi. The next speech from Mr. Gunawan Arianto, STM Com SC PhD, as the president of the International Office of UMS. To the Honorable Mr. Gunawan Arianto, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Amma ba'du uh, First of all, I would like to uh, welcome um, Professor Rakib Chaudhuri yeah. It's really uh, great to, to have you here uh, And also, it's my pleasure to come here to see the students the English department student from postgrad and undergrad. Uh, on behalf of the International Affair and Collaboration Office, uh, I, I, uh, I would like to appreciate the, the committee, the uh, lecturer in English department for conducting this uh, Professor, uh, visiting professor program. In the international office, we have like uh, encourage all of the department in in, in the university to have such a uh, good activity like this. So we hope uh, Professor uh, Koduri not only come for giving the lecture but also do like collaboration research, and eventually I hope uh, we will have like joint publication. So like student from postgrad, especially, I hope uh, when you do your thesis, uh, you can uh, basically try to pursue the knowledge from Professor Koduri and then try to basically get more insight and then if possible, uh, you can ask Professor Koduri to, to do the joint research. And in the international office, actually, we very encourage students to do like uh, international experience. So it's not only you go overseas, but also we invite uh, a very good professor to come to a university.
to our university. So yeah, uh, without further ado, I think uh, uh, I think we can uh, open this uh, stadium general uh, with uh, Basmala. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for Mr. And now we are entering the main agenda, the lecture by Dr. Rakib Choudhury from Monash University, who will be introduced by Mr. Suharyanto SPDMAD as the deputy of quality assurance in our department. Untuk untuk Bapak dan Ibu, dimohon meninggalkan tempat sejenak. And for all audience, don't forget to take, take a note. And if you want to ask about something, anything, you can interrupt. No, 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 it's fine. Then everything. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Is everybody okay? Okay, today we are going to have the <coughs> special guest lecture for today. However, before we start, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Wala alihi wa ashabi ajmain ama ba'du. Okay, dia ada semuanya. Today we are going to have a very special guest, especially for the visiting professor programs. As we know, in our department, visiting professor program has already become the regular activity that we always conducted, right? In this semester, we have many, not many actually, sorry, but many expert invited. Yeah, uh, for for this semester. We will have four uh, invitees uh, from four, four foreign countries. Uh, they are from Singapore, from Australia, from New Zealand, 
and once more from UK. And today is very special because usually for the last two years, we are having the visiting professor only for online activity during the Zoom, right? However, for today's meeting, it's very special because today our guest, our special guest is here with us. Okay, first of all, give applause for our special guest. <laughs> yeah. Today, me, myself, Mr. Oh, wait a minute. Do you know me before, right? Okay. So I don't need to introduce you a lot. I am Suhari Anto, right? Everybody just call me. How do you call me? Okay, let me try. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, no, no, like that. Mr. Mr. Harry, please. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Harry. Thank you. That's my name. Yeah, Mr. Harry. That's very popular here, right? Wait a minute. Okay, come back. I'm not going to talk a lot about me, yeah, because you already know me before, right? In the class, in the department, etc. And we can have a lot of things to share later on. However, today's focus is our special guest here. Can you see that in the slide? Today's special guest is Dr. Rokib Chowdhury. Am I right? Am I pronouncing you? Yes. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Yeah. Can I have to take off this one? It's a little bit disturbing for me. Yeah. But because, because I have a little bit cold since the last five days maybe, but it's already getting better actually. So no worries. Whenever you get cold, it's not about me. Yeah? It's not because of me. Yeah? Bukan karena saya. Okay. Today, our special guest is Dr. Rakib Chowdhury. Yes, you can see from the slide. Uh, Dr. Rakib Chowdhury, BA, MA, MED, and PhD. Oh, wow, that's very long names. And with long, what is that? Degree, right? And I hope that everyone here can continue like him someday, right? Amin, gitu dong? Amin, yeah. Okay, Dr. Rakib Chowdhury, usually I call him Rakib, right? Yes, Rakib is fine, yeah. Rakib is from Australia. Right now, he is the senior lecturer in the Faculty of Education, Monash University. Right, Monash University. And she, oh sorry, he has been teaching since 1996 in Bangladesh, Australia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Brunei, Saudi Arabia. Oh, that was real, real exper experience, right? And he got the PhD uh, degree from Monash in 2008. And right now, oh sorry, uh, Dr. Rokib, uh, Rokib now supervising PhD students since 2010. And he has already completed PhD supervisor 10. Uh, what is that? How do we call uh, 10 students? Or, yes, 10 students. Uh, current student, 10 students, 5 from Indonesia. This is very interesting, right? 5 from 10 is from Indonesia. And she, he has already completed the supervision. And right now, the current PhD supervision, he has 11 students and two from Indonesia. Why I'm saying that it's interesting, it means that this is a great chance if you want to continue in Monash University. Yeah, Dr. Rakib is here. If you want to know more about him, come on, please be ready with the approval, with the research, everything. Just, yeah, someday maybe you can contact Dr. Rakib. Is that right, Pak Rakib? Yes, that's right. And also, there are a lot of books, a lot of uh, editorial chief in TESOL Bangladesh Journal. And the area of teaching of research, TESOL, of course, sociolinguistic, identity, international, etc. A lot, actually. And methodologies, autocritical ethnography, and narrative inquiry is one of the, what is that? The expertise of Dr. Rakib here. And in Indonesian expert, what is that? Monash Herb Faith Indonesian Engagement Center. And also, this very... Interesting also, Pak Rakib or Dr. Rakib here, he has been working a lot collaboration with Indonesian scholar, Indonesian university, like visiting professor, keynote plenary speaker, at more than 30 events. You can imagine that. It means that Dr. Rakib is very familiar with Indonesia, and today he will share his experience, his understanding, his knowledge about research to all of you. So today, it's going to be the best chance, the best opportunity for you for having discussion with him, right? Okay, so maybe I'm not going to talk a lot because this is not about me today. Today is all about Pak Rakib or Dr. Rakib. So today, without any further ado, let please give applause to Dr. Rakib once more time to start this presentation. Okay, please, Dr. Rakib, this time is yours. 
Thank you very much, Harry. Can you stay here for a minute before, before you disappear? <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Senang sekali bisa berada di kota Solo yang indah ini bersama Bapak Ibu para pendidik. But the rest of the presentation will be in English because I don't speak Bahasa. All right, very glad to be here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rokib and uh, Harry, thank you very much for so generously introducing me. Uh, and you've just made my life a little more difficult because you're asking everyone to contact me for PhD supervision. That would make my life a bit difficult. Now, I know we have this uh, pillar in the middle, so you won't be able to see me. So I'll try to keep on walking across. Or some of you, can you come and push this on one side? <laughs> Let's move this to one side so that it's not blocking. But I'll be moving so you will all be seeing me. Um, Harry is very busy today because of the accreditation program, but while he's still here, in front of all of you, I'd like to acknowledge that Harry has been my host. So when he contacted me less than two months ago, when I was in Melbourne, Monash, he invited me in the visiting professor program saying that we have a regular visiting professor program at UMS. It is online, we use Zoom, and here is a list of courses. You can choose one of them. So I chose the research paper course. Uh, and then I said, a few days later, I said, you know what, Harry, I'm actually coming to Indonesia, so it doesn't have to be online. How about we do it face to face? And Harry said, OK, let me check for you. And then he gets back to me very quickly and said, yeah, why not? It doesn't have to be online. So here I am, because I had already planned to come back to Indonesia. I come to Indonesia every year. It's my favorite country. It's my second home in many ways, um, and you know, I feel very comfortable being here. Dara, Indonesia. It's in my blood. So, Harry, thank you very much for organizing this event in a very short period of time for your hospitality. Uh, and I'm very grateful for everything that you've done in trying to accommodate everything that I asked for. Uh, and it's a very good term, turn up of 150 maybe more students, which is really great. So, thank you very much, Harry. I'd like to acknowledge someone else. Now, among the faculty members at UMS is one of my former students from Monash University, Ms. Shahara Amelia. Come over here. That's why I asked you. <laughs> Ms. Shahara graduated from Monash University Faculty of Education in June 2013, yeah. exactly A 10 years ago. A decade. Yeah, please don't say anything bad about me in front of them. No, no, no. Because I'm pretending to... Yeah. yeah. So, I'm very proud to see one of my students from such a long time ago as a faculty member at this university. Because from what I have seen, I've been in... In the last 10 days, I've been to five different universities. This is my fifth university. But talking to your lecturers here and talking to some students, including... I know there are some international students from overseas as well, including where is Hassan? Yes, Hassan. Hassan is from Bangladesh, my country of origin. Having talked to some people here and your wonderful lecturers, I know that UMS is a wonderful university with very high quality academics, lecturers, high quality education, very beautiful and really impressive infrastructure. I mean, look at this building here. It's just wonderful. All the resources that you need. So in many ways, and the fact that UMS has a regular visiting professor program, it's a regular one, um, and offers scholarships to international students uh, is very impressive because these are some of the ways in which UMS is giving back to the community. And, and that is just wonderful. So you should all be very proud uh, to be students of UMS. And I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Shaharat, now it's your turn. Say something about your experience at Monash before I take over. Do you miss Monash University, Shahara? A lot. I do miss uh, Monash, Melbourne, and the vibes and everything. And uh, Rakib was very helpful. Uh, actually, I, w I wasn't in your class, but uh, Rakib is, yeah, is one of my tutor, and he's very kind, very helpful, and... Uh, you will see how 
kind how great he is. Later on. Don't say that. No, I won't. <laughs> uh, Rakib, one thing uh, I have to inform you, you can go run from here and there, but uh, mostly probably because uh, there's a, yeah. So you need to make sure you will be around, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you can take over. All right, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Shahara. So once again, uh, Harry, thank you so much for not just today, but for the last two months. Shahara, thank you very much. Um, and also, uh, where is uh, Indra? Indra, is Indra here? Indri. Okay, so my thank you to In Indri, and my thank you to Pa Gunawan, uh, and uh, Dr. Yeni, uh, who's also from Australia. She's got a PhD from Deakin University, uh, and to all colleagues, thank you very much. So we'll, we'll get started now. All right, Harry? Okay, that's good. I feel quite safe, you can leave me. I think they won't, they're not going to eat me alive. That's all right. Can I move up to here, camera? Here is okay, here is okay. All right, okay. We still have to move this away, otherwise <laughs> it's a bit difficult. All right, let's get started. So um, this, uh, what we had, so we have two classes, guys. We have two classes. Today is one, and then we have another one tomorrow, right? Uh, and hopefully, you will all turn up tomorrow. You won't say, oh my god, he talks too much. Uh, boring lecture, I don't want to go back. Uh, but I think you will be forced to come here by your lecturers. So unfortunately, you don't have any choice. You just have to be here. Even if you don't like me, you have to be here. So um, we have two classes, and these are some of the things that we would cover in the classes. Now, I have been told that some of you are about to do your research methodology. Some of you are, have started writing your thesis or proposal. But at the same time, there are some of you in this class, you haven't started writing a thesis or doing research. So you're still in your first or second year. So research is like a new thing for you. So I have to keep that in mind when I'm doing this class to make sure I'm not talking in a very advanced manner, or I'm not talking very basic things and you say, oh, we already know this, we don't need to hear it from Rakib, we already know it. So I'll kind of balance, but in order to do that, we will go back to the beginning and look at what is research. Now, it might be funny, like, what is research? Do we need to know? We know what research is, we just write a thesis, that is research. We talk to people, data analysis we write. But there is a difference between academic or scholarly research and any other kind of research, there's a difference. So I want to show you. And Regardless of what your topic is, the topic or the research question of your thesis, whatever it is, scholarly research and academic research is always very, very different from any other kind of research. So hopefully we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, social sciences research, we'll talk about that. That is different from natural sciences research. So you are all in the faculty and department of teacher education or PBI, English language education, is that right? Or maybe linguistics? Not from physics, right? Is anyone from physics or chemistry, biology, medical sciences? No, 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 no. So physics, chemistry, biology, etc. these are called natural sciences. So you guys are all in social sciences, broadly speaking. So the way we conduct research in social sciences, us, is different from the way research is conducted in natural sciences. So we'll talk about that. And then we look at a, a few things like theory, method, methodology, theoretical framework, etc. And then the red parts are the more practical parts, the red parts, so structure of a thesis or proposal, mechanics of writing proposal or thesis. And then I'll give you some hot topics for your publications or for your thesis, hot topics. So a topic that is contemporary, a topic that is considered to be important, things like that. Uh, and finally, I'll give you two examples of original research, just to show you how you can turn something very ordinary, very, very simple, ordinary, uh, into a good topic for your research. Because some of you are still thinking about a research topic. How many of you have already decided the topic for your research? Can you raise your hand? You know, I'm very informal, so I don't mind if you talk or shout or ask me questions at any time. How many of you know what topic you will do your thesis on? How many of you? No one? Really no one? Okay, 
Not a problem. That's exactly what we'll talk about. So we'll talk about some pieces. Now, some of these we will cover today. Some of these we will cover tomorrow. We have another class. All right, so let's start with what is research. Very boring question. Oh, my God. What is research, right? Okay. Now, the way we understand research, as I said, for academic purposes, is different from any other kind of research. Now, have you done research? How many of you have done research? Has anyone done research here? You're pushing her. You've done research? No? You've done research? No? Everyone here has done research. Everyone. Everyone here has done research. So, for example, when you buy a mobile phone, you do some kind of research, don't you? You, you just don't go to the shop and buy a mobile phone. You do extensive research. You talk to your friend, you go to Google, you read, um, you know, uh, reviews. You go to, uh, you know, YouTube maybe or Instagram. You try to see the reviews. You look at the specifications of two phones side by side. You make comparisons. You analyze. You gather information. You analyze data. You have a discussion with your students. And then you come to a conclusion. You make recommendations. That is research. That's exactly what we do in research. So you have all done research, whether it's buying a mobile phone or something trivial like that. You've done research. So we do research when we buy a mobile phone. Or a journalist also does research. So a journalist who investigates a particular problem like that incident, that tragic incident last year in Indonesia, the football stadium incident, right? Yeah, a lot of people died, very tragic. So the journalist goes there, does data collection, talks to people, interviews them, maybe video, audio recorded, transcribes them, analyzes them, uh, goes to Google, finds some facts about when the stadium was established, things like that, and then puts everything together, does an analysis, discussion, writes a report. That is also research. So when you buy a phone, you do research. When a journalist writes a report, they do research. But these are different from academic research. These are different from the kind of research you do when you write a thesis or a proposal at the university. That is different kind of research. So there is, here is a definition of academic research, the kind of research that you do for your study, for your thesis. By the way, I just want to show something. Uh, there is a whiteboard there. I can use it, I think, but it's too far. You, won't, you might not be able to read it. It's too far. Take a look. So when you do a bachelor's, I'll just write in very big letters. Yeah, maybe we can bring it here. No, but they, they, they need to see me as well. So you just keep it here. All right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. So I'll write really in really big letters. Hopefully you'll be able to see me over there. Really, really big, okay? So... So this is Scripsy, right? Scripsy. You write a Scripsy for undergraduate. What do you write for uh, masters? Thesis. Or thesis, right? What about PhD? Dissertation. Yep. Okay. Can you read this at the back? Do you have binoculars? Do you have binoculars? Yeah, you can see it. Anyway, so in Indonesia, scripts is for bachelor's, thesis for master's, dissertation is for PhD. Do you know that these three are three different languages? But they mean the same thing. Scripsy is Bahasa. Thesis is British English. Dissertation is American English, three different languages. It means the same thing. There's no difference. I know it because I've been here many times, but a thesis is a dissertation, is a script, it's the same thing, right? So in Indonesia, it's understood differently. So in my presentation, I'll be talking about thesis, 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 because in Australia, we say thesis. But it's the same as dissertation, it's the same as scripsy. The levels are different. So when I say thesis, it means everything. We don't use dissertation because dissertation is American. All right? So just keep that in mind. Now, if you look at the definitions there, don't worry. I don't read out my slides. So this is just... 
These are the different definitions of academic research. Academic research, not the research you do to buy a mobile phone, not the kind of research you need to do to, for a journalist to write a paper, academic research in a thesis. So if you look at these, what does it say here? Systematic, systematic. Just look at the highlights, systematic, systematic, disciplined, systematic, disciplined. So if you look at the highlights, Whatever way you define academic research or scholarly research, it has to be disciplined and systematic. Which means when you buy a mobile phone, you do research, but maybe it's not systematic or disciplined. It's kind of random in some ways. When a journalist writes a report, that is research. But maybe it is not systematic or disciplined. So it is not academic research. At Monash University, this is how we define research. Now, Monash University is one of the top universities in the world. It's probably number 44 or something. And <clears throat> the faculty of education is number 14 or number 16 in the whole world, or number 12, I think. So, so we not only conduct research at Monash University, we also define research. And it is seen as an example by everyone else. And this definition keeps on evolving over time, every few years. So we say, research is contributing to new knowledge. So research means you have to contribute to new knowledge. When you buy a phone, the kind of research that you do to buy a phone, do you contribute to new knowledge? No, it's just for your own knowledge. You know, you come to a decision, you buy a phone. It doesn't contribute to new knowledge. Or using existing knowledge in new and creative ways to generate new concepts, methodologies, etc. And it has to involve scholarly engagement. This is very important. Scholarly engagement means academic engagement. It means collaboration. It means dialogue with others. And that is why we publish, we get peer review, and we, we have people who cite our articles. So this is academic research. So how can we make research systematic so that academic research, the research you do in your scripsy or dissertation or thesis, is not the kind of research you do to buy a mobile phone, which is not systematic. How do we make it systematic? There is one big thing that makes the difference between academic research, non-academic research, and that is theory. That is theory. Does a journalist use any theory to write a report on the stadium tragedy? No. It's investigative journalism. Research is also investigative. But if you do academic research, you need theories. A journalist doesn't need theories. Do you use, did you use any theories to decide on your mobile phone? No. Okay. So what is a theory? This is my definition of a theory. It's from an article that was published a few years ago. I can send you the link. You can read it. But even my senior PhD students, if I ask them what is a theory, they will not be able to easily explain. It doesn't mean they don't know what theory is. Of course, they know what a theory is, but it's kind of abstract. It's difficult to explain. So here is a definition you can use. A theory is something that explains phenomena. And it is based on evidence. And it can be a statement that explicates or explains how and why things happen in a particular way. That is a theory. And a theory is what makes the difference between academic and non-academic research. Now, I would encourage you to take notes, not just to ask me questions, but when you start writing your dissertation or thesis, they will help you. So research is, this is academic research, guys. We are talking about academic research, the kind of research you need. Research is different from other forms of knowledge. Personal experience, opinion, Ideology, no, that's not research. Research is systematic. So the way you collect data, the way you analyze data, everything has to be systematic. What was the other word? Systematic and disciplined. Very good, yeah. So there you go, discipline inquiry. So I will tell you next how to make it disciplined, how to make it systematic. And it is also, research is also about justifying or rationalizing the ways of gathering, interpreting, reporting information. So justifying, justified ways means the choices that you've made, the methodological choices you've made, the theoretical choices you've made for your thesis, they have to be justified, not random. That's how you can make it systematic. 
uh, sets of principles and practices accepted for determining what is reasonable knowledge because it has evidence. But some, here are some common elements in social and educational research. So what are the components of research? What do we have in uh, scripsy or thesis or dissertation? What do we have? These are some of the elements. Conducting a literature review. We must read what other people have already done on the same topic and know what is already known. Using concepts and theories. Formulating research questions. So you need to have research questions. Even if you have a topic, even if you have an issue, even if you know your methodology, but you don't have research questions, you can't write a thesis. Sampling of cases, so that is about participants, that is about cases, that is about where the data comes from. Collecting data. Analyzing data. Writing up of research findings. Finally, we have to write it. If it's in your head, it doesn't work. Research has to be written. All right, so research is problematic. What does that mean, research is problematic? Does it mean that, you know, when you do research, you have a lot of problems? I mean, it is true. When you do research, you have a lot of problems, right? Yeah, but th that's not what I mean by research is problematic. Let me explain. It means something different. Research is problematic because it aims to make and insist upon problems. So it tries to identify problems, try to understand it. So research looks into things that people don't think are problematic. They think it's okay, there's no problem, but they try to find a problem, try to understand it, okay? It is not only at any point, it is not at any point simple, straightforward, or uninvolved. It gets more and more complex when you do research. So in the social sciences, remember guys what I said? English language education, teacher education, these are all in social sciences, not in natural sciences. So in social sciences, the other word that we often use for research is problematization. Can you say that together? Problematization. Now I'm using an S. If it's American, it would be a Z, right? Zation with a Z. But in America or the UK, we use S. It's just a spelling variation. It's the same thing. So problematization means in research, we take something very simple and something that no one is questioning and something that is taken for granted, something that is kind of common sense, right? Very simple. And we try to analyze it and find that it is actually not simple. It is actually very complex. So turning something simple into something complex is called problematization. So if you are researching something like, um, something like uh, student motivation, if that is your research topic, you can say, my research will problematize student motivation in my classroom, in a secondary school in Indonesia. My study will problematize. It means something is simple, but I will show that there are actually problems in there. So if you look at this image, it will show you how it works and how complex it can be. And you know, the different phases of doing research. It's just a funny image of looking at problematization. Now, remember what I said, there are two types of subjects taught at university. One is STEM, which stands for what? What is STEM? S-T-E-M, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, very good. So that is one. What is HAS? H A S S. Humanities, arts, social sciences. So which group are we in? We are in HAS, right? We are not in STEM. We are in HAS. So these two subjects are very different. And research is also very different. Do we use microscopes in our research? No. Do we use uh, chemical reagents in our research? No, what do we use? We use observations, interviews, right? So it's very different. So what is the difference? Natural sciences, 
physics, chemistry, biology, etc. It is based on objectivism or positivism. Who can tell me what we see wig means? We see wig. You know that in red font. We see wig. What does it mean? Anyone? We see wig. Say it louder. What you see is what you get. Exactly. Thank you. We see wig means what you see is what you get. So the natural scientist will look through the microscope. The natural scientist will look through you know, any other measurement or a chemical reagent. And they will see exactly what is happening there because they are objective. They are objective and they will have to report it. Everyone sees exactly the same thing. So if there are 10 scientists, they will see the same thing. What you see is what you get. However, in social sciences, for us, what you see is not what you get. So if you're observing a classroom, you can't see that through a microscope. You have to see that through your own understanding and cognition. And five different researchers will see the same thing and interpret it in five different ways. So in social sciences, we are based on constructivism or interpretivism, not objectivism, constructivism. So try to remember that. If I give 10 students from here, 10 students, the same topic for your thesis, same topic, same research questions, same journal articles for your literature review, the same participants, the same data set, so the transcripts, and even the analysis is the same, you will still come at 10 different conclusions because it is not objective. So remember that. Any topic, when you research it, it will be unique. Who is this person here? William Shakespeare. Who was William Shakespeare? He was a great footballer from Barcelona. Midfielder or no? Who was William Shakespeare? He was an English author, poet, dramatist, right? And he wrote what? Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, right? Plays. What about this guy? Albert Einstein, he did what? He's a scientist, physicist, right? Theoretical physicist, and he came up with E equals MC squared. Okay. Think about what they do in terms of research or activities. If Einstein didn't come up with E equals MC squared, if he didn't discover it in the 1940s, someone else would have discovered it, right? Because it's the law of nature. It's there. It's true. It's objective. So Einstein was so smart, he was the first one who came up with it. If Einstein didn't exist, someone else would come up with exactly the same thing, E equals MC squared, maybe five years later, 10 years later. It must happen. But if Shakespeare hadn't written Hamlet, no one else would have written Hamlet. If Michelangelo didn't uh, make that sculpture of uh, David, no one else could have done it. If the artists of Borobudur didn't make the Borobudur temple, no one else could have done that. These are unique. So that's the difference between social sciences and natural sciences, each representing one. So if you look at the difference between what we do in social sciences, which is on the right side of the screen, and natural sciences, which is what STEM researchers do on the left side of the screen, you will see that in our case, research means it will be subjective, it will be fluid, which means changing, it would be constructed rather than ordered, and the researcher is a participant observer rather than a disinterested scientist, objective scientist. So just remember that. Any kind of research will involve your own interpretation, so the results will always be unique. So let's take a closer look. I'll give you a practical example of how when you are researching a topic, sometimes you see certain things, sometimes you don't see certain things. And even if you see certain things, you interpret it differently in social sciences. So let's take a look. Now, this is my classroom at Monash University. 
You can see my students. These are all TESOL students, Monash University. Do you like the classroom? Yeah, I think this room is much better than that. But we need to move this away. This one is interrupting us. Anyway, so what we normally do is at the last, in the last class of each semester, we take a group photo. Just like goodbye, you know, we take a class photo, right? So here is one class photo that we took. This was about two years ago. Do you see some maybe Indonesian students here? Yeah, okay. So my question is, do you see anything interesting in this group photo? Anything interesting? Anything, like anything interesting, tell me. The, the what? The desk, yeah. So the desk is kind of funny shaped. It's not round, it's not square. Yeah, that's weird. And it even has electric uh, sockets there, in there, plug, yeah. Anything else? Strange, interesting, <laughs> funny, weird. What do you see in this picture? Okay, so are you trying to see it as, oh, sorry, the camera is there, sorry. You see me from here, the camera? Okay. Okay, so a STEM scientist we look at it in one way. He will just, you know, same sciences, natural scientist, objective. He will count the number of students and say, okay, mm, we have 37 students, whatever, right? This is the number of male, number of female. This is the number of those standing, number of those sitting, number of those wearing warm clothes, number of those not wearing warm clothes, um, number of those who are wearing hijab, uh, and then all of these kind of objective observations. This is what a STEM scientist will look at, but we look at differently, and we interpret it differently, because research in social sciences is interpretivist. It is not objective. So I want you to take a closer look and see something very interesting here. For example, on one side, we have all students from Vietnam. They're all on one side. On the other side, all students from China. All of them are together. In the middle, we have students from Indonesia. They're all together, sitting with me. That's me in the middle. And at the back is just one student from one country, because there is no one else from that country. This is Sarah from Iran. Poor Sarah. There's no one else. She doesn't know where she will stand from. So she's right in the middle. Just doesn't know where to stand. Okay, now if we look at the bigger picture, back to the bigger picture, here is the thing. We take a photo at the end of the last class, and it's a random photo. It's, I don't ask them to stand according to their country or you know, according to whatever. So no one asked them, and there's nothing wrong with them standing in that way. It's, it's fine, absolutely fine, nothing wrong. But the question is, why do students tend to cluster with students from the same language background or cultural background? Why do they do that? They feel connected? Okay, now they're just taking a photo. Why do they need to feel connected? They just take a photo. We don't know that, right? Okay? And I mean, this is interesting because, you know, it was only later when I looked at the photo, I realized that, you know, they're standing like Vietnamese, Chinese, Indonesian, and then Sarah's there over there. Very interesting. You can conduct many, many different types of research based on this one photo. It could be about culture, it could be about language, it could be about linguistic identity, it could be about social cohesion, it could be about power relations, it could be about equity, it could be about social justice, pedagogy, peer um, feedback or uh, kind of uh, peer collaboration, um, use of space. Uh, it could be about gender. It could be about, you know, uh, Hofstede's cultural dimensions, six dimensions of culture, all of these things. So you can get, I don't know, 20, 30 different topics by looking at this one picture. So what we are doing here, if we want to research this picture, is we are problematizing it. That is what research is. We, problem we take something simple and say, oh, this is just a photo. Put it on Facebook, tag everyone, get likes and comments, and forget about it. No problem. It's okay. Because the photo was taken just to share, right? On social media, maybe on uh, Instagram or somewhere. 
But if you look at it closer, there is a lot of things interesting happening. So we are trying to problematize something simple. That is research, okay? That's what we do. So when you think about choosing a topic, you can take just a normal topic, something that is, no one is arguing about it, but you will see, oh my God, there's a lot of things here. And the more you read literature, the more you know theories, the better you will know how to analyze and interpret something like this in a different way. So, another definition of research is to make the familiar strange. So something that is already familiar, right? We see it every day. You turn it into something strange, which is the same thing as problematization, okay? So research is a systematic or disciplined attempt to re-see the everyday. Re-see means you're putting a new pair of glasses, the critical lens of theories, and that allows you to see what's in front of you that you can't see otherwise. That is research. So when you write a thesis or a scripty, it means you are actually using theories to understand just normal everyday situations in a very, very critical manner. And you're doing that in a systematic way. Now, whatever your topic is, remember, academic or scholarly research has to be this. Making the familiar strange to problematize. So, some people say research is common sense, but it is organized common sense. So, this is actually a definition, okay? So, it's, we already know it, but we are trying to systematize it. So, common sense. So just look at this. Tell me what you think about this comic strip here, just for fun. Okay, so you see there's a problem with common sense here. So relying on common sense, we take for granted, here is another quote, we take for granted that the purpose of social inquiry or the purpose of research uh, is not only to generate new knowledge, but to reform common sense. So common sense means things that we take for granted. When we do research, we realize, oh no, we shouldn't take it for granted. There are problems in there. So that is how research can be seen as a way of organizing common sense. Now, look at this quote here. Have you heard the name of Confucius? Confucius, he was a Chinese philosopher, right? So what I love about Confucius is his awesome eyebrows, really cool eyebrows. I mean, look at his eyebrows, mustache, and his beard, really good. I wish I had eyebrows like that. I'll try. But I also like him as a philosopher because many, many centuries ago, he have said, he said, you know, words of wisdom that are still true today. So he says, knowledge without reflection is a waste of time. What does it mean, knowledge without reflection? It means you know something, but you don't think about it. You just accept it. You refuse to problematize something. You know, it's like I know students do well when we help them more. This is knowledge because it's common sense. If you, stu if you help students more, they will do well. Knowledge, but you don't think about it. You don't problematize it. If you don't problematize it, you will never know that help doesn't always help students. So there's something called scaffolding. Do you know about the term scaffolding? It means helping someone in the classroom. Scaffolding is not the same as help. If you help students and make things too easy, they don't learn. So helping is always, not always good. But if you stop thinking and you don't reflect on it, then you will never know that it is problematic. Helping is not always helping. On the other hand, reflection without knowledge is dangerous. So it's like you don't know about something, you just reflect on it. That's daydreaming. Okay, so Confucius, the man with the awesome eyebrows, says that we have to combine knowledge and reflection. So from critical thinking, we move to critical reading, and then finally, we move into critical writing, which is writing a thesis or a dissertation or a scripty. So we have to start critically, even before we start writing critically. We have to read and we have to think critically. Okay, so 
what we need to remember is do not rely on your common sense because research is exactly the opposite of common sense. Common sense says, okay, I already know this. I don't need to research it. I don't need to problematize it. Let's just accept it. That is what common sense says, right? Research says no. Let's not accept it. Maybe there are other answers to this. Maybe there is another reason why this is happening. We need to understand it. How do we understand it? By taking a disciplined and what was the other word? Systematic. Disciplined and systematic approach to understanding phenomena through evidence, so methodology, theory, okay? So I'll show you two sentences now to provoke you. Common sense, what's the problem with common sense? Why should we question things that no one is questioning? I'll show you two sentences. I want you to problematize these two sentences that people take for granted, that people don't question anymore, to understand how we should be thinking when we conduct research. Here is the first question. I want you to problematize it. Tell me what you think. Can you problematize this sentence instead of taking it for granted, instead of saying, oh, this is common sense, we know it, because that's what we read in the books. That's what the history book says. And indeed, it is a historical fact. Christopher Columbus did discover America in 1492. That is actually true. There is evidence for that. Historians have written about it. You can't dispute it. And it is Christopher Columbus. We know that the Spanish queen sent Christopher Columbus, and in 1492, he arrived in America, and he discovered it. So how can you problematize something that is already well known, like a universal truth? How can you problematize it? Anyone? Is there anything problematic, unacceptable in this sentence? Anyone? Just be brave enough. Raise your hand. Yes, tell me. Can you tell me why? The problem discovered is a problem. Why is it a problem? This word is a problem. 1492 is not a problem. It is true. Christopher Columbus is not a problem. It is true. America is not a problem. It is true. The problem is discovered because if you write this sentence or if you accept this sentence, it means America didn't exist before 1492. So you are taking a Eurocentric view. America was not known to Europeans before 1492, but America was still there. It was a land. There were Native Americans there. Thousands, millions of people were there. Maybe not millions, thousands. But when you say discover, it means you are seeing it from the Eurocentric, the European point of view. For them, it was discovered. So it is problematic. The national anthem of Australia, the second line of the national anthem, used to say, we are young and free. In 2021, just two years ago, they changed the lyrics of the national anthem, like Indonesia Raya, we, you know, our national, they changed it. Now we don't say we are young and free. We say we are one and free, one, not young. Because Australia's history, they used to say it's a young country because, you know, it's only been less than 300 years. So it's much shorter than Majapahit and, you know, the much longer history of Indonesia. But if you say it's a young country, you're only talking of the white settlers coming from Europe, especially from England, to colonize the country. But even before that, the Aboriginal people were in Australia for 60,000 years, much older than Majapahit and the other kingdoms here. So it's no longer right to say Australia is a new country because you're denying the local people. You're just seeing it from the white people's point of view. Same thing here. America was not discovered by Christopher Columbus. It already existed, so you're being critical. You have to think like that when you do research. Here is the second question that I want you to problematize. Bangladesh, where I was born, is an overpopulated country. Again, that is a fact. We have 180, almost 200 million people in a country that is much smaller than the island of Java. So the density per square kilometer is much higher than in most countries, it's, it's higher than in Indonesia, the, because Indonesia is also a large country. So the density kind of evenly plays out. What's the problem with this sentence here, overpopulated country? 
Okay, the problem is, so it's a fact that it's overpopulated, you know, 180 millions, etc., whatever. The problem is who decides when it is over or under? Why is it over? Over what? Who decides? It's a construction. It is not an objective truth because there is no such thing naturally which says what is over, what is under, what should be the optimum population per square kilometer. It's not natural. It's a construct. Someone has made it. Who is it? You know, it's the United Nations or the World Bank or IMF, International Monetary Fund. They have made a criteria of saying this is over, this is under. And it can be disputed, it can be problematized, it can be criticized. Because they do it in a way so that they can categorize countries into high earning countries, high GDP, medium GBD, GDP, low GDP, poor countries, developing countries, so that they can provide them with aid. And when they provide them with aid, they have power over these countries. They can control them. That's why they say overpopulated. But there are problems with being critical. We'll have some fun now. It's not easy to be critical, like America was discovered by Christopher Columbus. Bangladesh is an overpopulated country. There are problems, not so easy. So I want to do two thought experiments with you. Please enjoy. I will ask you some questions. I want you to answer these questions, OK? So this, you know, what's the topic here? The topic is about being critical, or can we be critical, or are there problems? So here's the first one. Uh, I'll show you two images, and I'll ask you two questions. So these are two images here I'll show you. What are these images called? You know, like square, rectangle, triangle, oval. Do they have any names in Bahasa or in English, these geometrical shapes? Yes, they do. One is called Taketa, one is called Naluba. So tell me very quickly, which one is Taketa? Taketa is the one on the left or the right? The left. The left is Taketa? Is this Taketa? Okay, and this one is Naluma, right? This one is Naluma? Yeah, I think so as well. How do you know that? You feel like that's it's supposed to be, right? Exactly, yeah. So here's the second question. One is male, one is female. Okay, let me guess. Most of you are thinking this is male. This is female. Most of you are thinking this is male, Taketa, and this is female. Why? So I want you to be very frank and just tell me why you think the one on the left is Taketa and it is male. The one on the, le on the, on the right is female and it looks like and sounds like Naluma. Why? Tell me some. Tell me some reasons why. All right. Tell me, what do you think? Why do you think the one on the right side is Naluma and uh, it is female? Why do you think? Just whatever comes to your mind, there's no right or wrong answer. Just tell me. It's okay. Yeah, why are you pushing her? <laughs> You're telling her to save you. Can you tell me, you, which one is, uh, uh, why Naluma is the one on the right? And Naluma sounds like female, Taketa sounds like male, why? Huh? It feels all right, exactly. Yeah, common sense, exactly, common sense. Now, I want you to unpack common sense. You tell me a bit more about co common sense. Let me guess, let me guess why. Sorry, I have two displays, so I can't show both. So just follow my words. The one on the left, you know, the shape is sharp and hard, and it's, it's not soft, it's, it's, it looks like it's rugged, it is rough. And the word taketa is also kind of rough, rugged, you know, taketa. So it's supposed to be like male characteristics, and the shape is sharp. The one on the right is soft, round, curvy, and even the sound, naluma, sounds softer, right? Naluma. But Taketa. So, because of the sound and the shape, we try to attribute them with names and genders. There's nothing wrong if you're thinking in that way. In fact, if you're thinking the opposite, then there is something wrong. Okay, so here's the thing. It's called sound symbolism. Harder, more masculine, softer, more feminine, etc., etc. Now, 
what does this indicate? It indicates that we all have certain ways of looking at the world. And these certain ways of looking at the world are not logical, are not systematic, are not disciplined, and they are the manifestations of our prejudices and biases. And that can prevent us from being critical when we write a thesis. And that happens subconsciously, so we don't even know that is happening. I mean, this is just an image, a harmless, harmless image, not a problem. But imagine when you're analyzing data in your research. The same kind of biases, preconceived biases, might prevent you from seeing the world in certain ways. So, is it all in our minds, beyond our control? So, a cleaning spray is called BAM because it sounds convincing like BAM. You just spray it, wipe it once, and it's clean. But a perfume, sweet-smelling perfume, is Chanel. Now, what if you change the names? Swap the names. So the cleaning agent is called Chanel. It doesn't sound convincing. Or the perfume is called Bam. You know, it, it's not romantic or sweet or nice smelling or whatever. So it's in our minds. So the question is, does language determine how we perceive the world? Makes us look at certain things and not being able to see certain things? Yes. Are our thinking and behavior determined by our language? Yes, it does. I'll give you an example. So there is something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Maybe you know it. It's called the theory of linguistic determinism. Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Now, these guys found out that the languages that we speak and write will determine what we are able to see and what we are not able to see. For example, if you speak Javanese, Bahasa, or if you speak Bahasa and Minangkabau, or Sasak, or Minahasa, or Madhuris, or Sundanese, they will all make you see the world in certain ways. And not being able to see the world in certain other ways. And knowing the language means the linearity of writing. You know, are you writing from the left to the right? From the left to the right? Or Arabic, from the right to the left? or Nihongo, Japanese, from the top to the bottom, or even Putonghua, Chinese, traditional Chinese, from the top to the bottom. So this, and even syntax, the arrangement of words, like how do you say brown sugar, gula merah? Why don't you say merah gula? Because it's supposed to be merah gula, brown sugar. In English, you don't say sugar brown, so why do you put the adjective after the noun? It's supposed to be at the front. No, it's not supposed to be. Bahasa is a different language. It has its own rules. It doesn't have to be like English. But because of this syntactic difference, gula merah, you think in a certain way. If you learn English, you are saying merah gula, merah gula. So you are thinking in a different way. So the more languages you know, the more ways you can see the world. So here is an example. The Inuit or the Native Eskimo people who live in Greenland, they have more than 50 words to describe snow. Because they can actually see the difference between snow. They can actually see it differently. What about in Bahasa? How many words do you have in Bahasa for snow? Salju, just one. Because you don't need more than one. And you, your, your vision is limited to seeing snow as one thing, snow. Here's another example, Arabic, camels. More than a hundred words to describe camels because they can tell them apart, they can see them apart. But in Bahasa, just unta, there's nothing else because you don't need it. But because you don't have more than one word, you can't actually see more than one kind of camel or one kind of snow. You can't do that unless if you're a scientist. What about family structures? So, because you just have one word, unta and salju, doesn't mean Bahasa is a very limited language, no. On the other hand, Bahasa has all these beautiful words, distinct words to describe relationships that we don't have in English. In English, we only have aunt, uncle. We don't have whether it's father's brother or mother's brother or older, younger, great-grandparents, great-grandson. 
we don't have all of these words. You have distinct words in Bahasa. So Bahasa might not have anything more than Unta or Salju, but on the other hand, when it comes to family structures, social configurations, it is actually richer. So what I'm trying to say here is the language or languages that we know and use and speak can impose certain limitations to how we see the world, Taketa, Naluma, Unta, Salju, remember all of that. So in higher education, you know, you're doing bachelor's degree, critical thinking leads to critical writing. You have to think critically first. Find out your biases, prejudices, in order to be able to write good quality thesis. And you have to see the full picture. Look at the last point here. Do not miss the wood for the trees. What does it mean? There is a place in Jogja called uh, Hutan Pinus, right? Pine forest. Have you been there, Hutan Pinus? Some of you? It's a good place to take your Instagram photos. Really nice. So you stand in Hutan Pinus and you look around you and you see the pine trees. You know, you see the trees, you take photos, and then you say, I'm seeing all the trees, but where is the forest? This is supposed to be a pine forest, but I'm only seeing the trees. But the truth is you're actually in the middle of the forest and all the trees make up the forest. So that, that's what it means. Do not miss the wood for the trees. In other words, do not fail to see the bigger picture and just concentrate on small things. And I'll give you an example. Do we see, do we all see the same? Like Salju Unta, do we all see the same thing objectively? Remember what I said. Natural sciences, objectivism. Everyone sees the same thing through the microscope. Everyone sees the same thing. In social sciences, it might be in front of you, like my class picture, right? Everyone in the group photo, but you don't see the same thing. You see different things. So, do we all see the same? Can you spot the odd color here, guys? So, this one is blue, right? And so, this is Biru and everything else is Hijau. Okay, does anyone not see this? You need to go to the eye doctor if you can't see the blue spot here. I think we all have normal eyes here, okay. Now, there is a scientist and anthropologist called Davidoff. He did an experiment showing this image to a group of people in Africa, in East Africa. They are called the Himba. Beautiful people, uh, and they live a traditional life. So he showed this image to the Himba so that they can spot the odd color, the blue color. And this is what they saw. They couldn't see the blue color. Why? Why do you think they couldn't see the blue color? Because it's supposed to be objective. If it's in front of you, you should be able to see it. And you just write about it. So remember, this, the topic is research paper. We are talking about research. How to write, how to read, how to analyze data, how to interpret data. So that's what it is. Observation, seeing things, not seeing things, biases, prejudices. That's why I'm showing you these examples. Why do you think the Himba couldn't see the blue color? The answer is because they don't have a word for blue. They don't have that word. Now, how is that possible? Don't, is the sky green, not blue? No, no, no. It is blue, but they, they, they can't distinguish it. They can't describe it. They don't have a word for it. You don't believe me? Well, you only know Unta and Salju. You don't know anything else because the Eskimos and the Arabs, they can see different types of snow and camel. You can't see it. It's in front of you, but you can't see it. But something else happened. The Himba couldn't see the blue, but this is what they actually saw. This is what they saw. So let's get to the picture and tell me if this green looks different here. Does it look different? Does anyone have Himba eyes here? Anyone with Himba eyes? Does it look different? It is actually different. It is different and this is not a trick. This is not an optical illusion. This is not, I'm not trying to trick you. It is actually true. It is different. Does anyone have Himba eyes? No, no. You have Indonesian eyes. You don't have Himba eyes and some international eyes here as well. Okay. This is what they see. So how is all of this related to writing a thesis or proposal? You know, Taketa, Naluma, male, female, Salju, Unta, 
David Dobbs experiment, blue and green. How is this related to thesis or proposal or, or dissertation or scripsy? Same thing. Same thing. There's no difference. How is it related? Because there are certain obstacles that prevent us from being critical. Because as I said, being critical is the first step to writing a thesis. Why? Because thesis or research in social sciences means problematization. Remember, you take something simple, you make it complex. How do you make it complex? By being critical, by not accepting that it's natural for students from Vietnam, Indonesia, China to stand separately. There is something more interesting. I need to be critical. There are problems to being critical. And some of these problems are culturally based. They are unconscious. They are invisible. And they stem from our prejudice, our bias because of our culture, language, etc. For example, the first one, xenophobia. What does xenophobia mean? Fear of the unknown. It doesn't mean ghosts. It just means something that you are skeptical about, something that you do not trust. Not because they are untrustworthy, but because you don't know them. It's like a, a stranger. We normally wouldn't trust a stranger. So if I want to go to the toilet, would I leave my mobile phone or my bag with someone sitting outside having a cigarette? Pa, please keep my bag. I'll be back in five minutes. It doesn't mean that they are not honest or they are not trustworthy. It's just because I don't know them. That is xenophobia. And we, we have xenophobic attitude towards other races, other religions, other cultures, other countries. It's called xenophobia. That is something that prevents us from being critical. And we have to get rid of that in research. Second one is ethnocentrism. What is ethnocentrism? It means we judge other people by the standards of our own culture. So the Indonesians might find it weird and strange or funny or amusing that the Chinese use chopsticks, right? But the, Indonesia, but the Chinese would also find it equally amusing, weird, strange, or funny that Indonesians use their hands to eat. There's nothing. Or, or the sarung. And they would think, oh, sarung is for female. Why is a man wearing a skirt? That is ethnocentrism. We try to judge other people according to the standards of our own culture. That also prevents us from being critical. And the third one is cultural relativism, and that is related to ethnocentrism. Cultural relativism means that the logic of everything is legitimate and acceptable within its own culture. Because just because people accept it, it is universally accepted. That is called cultural relativism. For example, in some societies, juvenile or underage marriage is not illegal. So, you know, a 12-year girl can be married. Someone who's not even mentally prepared to be married, they are being married. That is called cultural relativism. So there are problems with these as well. All right, so now let's get into the writing part of it. The writing part means, you know, we, we know about criticism, we know about being critical, we know about social sciences, constructivism, we know about our cultural biases, we know about xenophobia, ethnocentrism, etc. So what does that mean in terms of writing a thesis or a proposal? Well, when you want to read critically, you have to remember two things. Here is the first one. Critical reading, so when you're writing a journal article, means thinking about text, you know, the article, as something that has been constructed by a mind that is influenced by social, cultural, religious, etc., etc., values embedded in the language. So which means you have to remember that the person who has written it is also a human being, and they might have their own prejudices, biases. You don't need to accept it. You can be critical about it. On the other hand, critical reading is also about being aware of how, as readers, we also draw on our own social, cultural, etc., values to interpret. So it means that the prejudice or the bias that can prevent us from knowing the truth may be not the author, but ourselves. We might be reading an article in a particular way because of who we are as a cultural being, as a political being, as a religious being, as a national being. 
So there are biases and prejudices on both sides. So there are two types of thinking when it comes to academic reading and writing. I'm talking about research. On the left-hand side is egocentric thinking. Ego means self. It means you are being spontaneous. You remember what I said, common sense? You know, the problem with common sense, you're, being, you're using common sense, you're being sentimental, impulsive, instinctive, and saying, oh, I know what it is. So that is lower order thinking, egocentric thinking. It is not good for thesis or research, but that is easier, and that's what we tend to do if we are not critical enough. On the other hand, we have critical thinking, which is higher order thinking. It is studied, conscious, not subconscious. Analytical, disciplined, what was the other word? Systematic, right? Truth-seeking, logical, reflexive, etc. So we have to move from the left to the right in our writing. So let me show you an example. So when it comes to the practicalities of writing, when we write for a thesis, the language is different from the language we use in social media or text messages or just writing informally because it has to be systematic and disciplined. So let's compare these two passages here. Here is the first passage here. I want you to read it and tell me if this is, if there is any problem with it or it is, if it is well written or what do you think about this language, the first one here. Okay, so if you look at this sentence, it's a, it's a kind of a definition of capital, so maybe in economics, right? Economics? So is there anything wrong with this language here? Capital is a difficult thing to understand. We can explain it in different ways. How we apply financial physical concepts of capital isn't easy. So is there anything wrong with this language? Look, guys, I'll be finishing in maybe 10, 15 minutes, and we'll have q and I know you're probably already bored, but uh, I'll, I'll be finishing soon. Don't worry. Then you can all go and have lunch. Um, what do you think about this language? Is there anything wrong with this language? Too many definitions? Um, actually, yes, that is true. But it's actually from different types of people, like you know, accountants. And then another group, so too many, but because of different people. But the language is actually OK. There is no grammatical mistake. Uh, there is no syntactical mistake. The language is clear. Everything is fine. Now, let's write the same passage or definition uh, in a different way. Here is the second one. I want you to read this and tell me how or why it is different from the first one. In terms of what they are saying, it's actually the same thing, exactly the same thing, right? It's the same topic, it's saying the same, it's giving the same information. But the language is very different. Now, which one is better? The right one is better? Does everyone agree the right one is better? Okay. Now, you are sitting in a cafe, having a coffee or a drink in, in a cafe, right? You and your friend. And your friend is asking you, hey, buddy, can you tell me what is capital? Can you explain to me what is capital? And then he starts saying, capital is a complex notion. There are many definitions of the word itself. And capital, as applied in accounting, can be viewed conceptually from a number of standpoints. It would sound a bit weird if your friend is talking in that kind of language. Capital is a different notion. But if your friend rather uses the, the one on the left, capital is a difficult thing to understand. That sounds more natural. 
So why is the one on the right side better? Because the register is different. So if you're writing a thesis, the one on the right sounds more natural, appropriate. The one on the left is when you talk to a friend, informal, that one sounds more natural. So the difference here is not language or grammar or vocabulary or diction or you know, anything like the mechanics of writing. It is the tone of the writing which makes one non-academic and the other one academic or scholarly, okay? So remember, what I'm talking about is when you, when you are critical, when you are reflective, when you are problematizing something, it also has to be reflected in the kind of language that is appropriate. And it has to be that kind of language on the right side. So these are some of the differences between these two kinds of languages. Formal, the other one is informal, but more conversational. Nothing wrong with it. It's okay but it is not appropriate for writing research. So when you read an article, these are some of the questions you should consider in order to make sure you are not just reading, but you are reading critically. Remember one thing, guys. Reading critically or critical reading doesn't just mean I disagree with this or that. Just because you disagree with something doesn't make it critical. You have to ask these questions. One of the things we do in order to be critical is referencing, right? And you do it in your other assignments as well, not just in a thesis. So referencing is one way to be accountable, systematic, disciplined. So, look at this sentence here. What do you think about this sentence? I think girls do better at high school than boys. Is that right, actually? The girls, girls do better than boys in high school? SMA? In Indonesia, is that true? That is true. Everyone agrees? Why? The boys are too lazy? The boys are too lazy. Is that why? Why do you think girls do better than boys? Okay, now that might be true, but you know, if you write this sentence in a thesis or a script, it might be a problem. Why do you think this is a problem if you write in a thesis? I think girls do better than at high school than boys. Why is it a problem? Because first of all, you can't say, I think. You know, who cares what you think? We don't care what you think. Secondly, what do you mean by do? Does it mean studies or sports uh, core or extracurricular activities or final exams or, you know, classroom interaction or what? Do doesn't mean anything. It is very imprecise. Uh, better, even better is a problem, number three, better. Better means what? Quantitatively, qualitatively, consistently, sometimes, randomly, we don't know. High school, okay, high school, fine. Which country, when, where, we don't know, then boys. So there are a lot of problems here. So instead of saying, I think girls do better at high school than boys, we say something like this. To be more accountable, responsible, and to make it more evidence-based. So here we say girls are consistently, so there is a qualifier, not sometimes, consistently, outperforming. It's better than do. Boys at the secondary school, for example, and then there's some statistics and there's this time here, TER, Tertiary Education Ranking. And then there is some statistics, 15%. So we have something a bit more specific. All right? So this is why we need referencing. And referencing is the best way of providing evidence. Now, when you do referencing, there are two things you need to keep in mind. Two things. You have to remember two things. Here's the first one. I want you to compare this sentence, just read it first, and then I'll make this second, just read it very quickly. Now, I want you to compare this with the second sentence. And tell me what's the difference. Does anyone think they're different? Or 
are they saying the same thing? They're different, but they're saying the same thing, but written differently, right? Yeah. So, um, what do you think? Are they saying the same thing or different things? What do you think, guys? I know you're feeling sleepy and bored. That's okay. I'll be finishing soon. Don't worry. Which one do you think is better? Which one is better? Second one is better? Think. What do you think? Second one as well? Does everyone think the second one is better? No, I think some of you actually think the first one is better. So who, want, who thinks the first one is better? Yes, okay. Anyone else thinks the first one is better? Okay, so let me give the answer. They are both good, you know, as good as it can be. And it's not, you can't even compare them. So here's my second question to give you a clue. If you are writing the introduction, the introduction part of a section, which one is more suitable? The first one or the second one for the introduction part? Yes, yes, the second one. The second one is more, it sounds more like introductory, right? Now, later on in the body of your essay, it is more appropriate to use the first one, not the second one. So it's actually depending on where you're writing, you can cite two ways. The first one is called the author prominent citation because the name of the author is outside the parenthesis or the bracket, outside. So Byron says that. Byron has expressed that. Byron argues that. Byron established that. So it is all about Byron, author prominent. The second one, Byron is inside the parenthesis, inside the bracket. So here Byron is not important. What he says is more important. Now in an introduction, the focus is on the topic, not on the author, not on the researcher. That's why the researcher can take a back seat. You go inside the bracket. We are just acknowledging you, but you're not important. What you're saying is more important. And that's what we need to do in an introduction. So whether you use an author prominent citation or a statement prominent citation, it depends on where it is located, introduction or later on. So this is the first thing you need to remember about citation. There are two ways of citing. Don't always say he said this, she said this. No. You can actually turn it around. Here is the second example. I want you to read this together and tell me what you think. Look at the language. These are the subtle things that would make your writing much, much better. It's not about grammar. It's about the mechanics of writing. All right. So, because we don't have much time, I'm just trying to go through it quickly. By the way, you will all get a copy of the PowerPoint, so don't worry about, you know, if you've missed anything. Um, you're going to pay me for this. It's not free. You have to pay me one million rupiah, for each of you, for uh, the PowerPoint slides. Uh, and if you pay more, you will get a premium version with my voiceover in it. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm serious. I'm serious. Come on. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. It's free and you'll all get it. You'll get a copy of it. It's in that computer, in that laptop over there. The, is the PowerPoint here? In this laptop, the PowerPoint? Okay. So you know which one to steal, you know, before you leave. Okay. So what we notice here is that it starts with a general statement. Loneliness is experienced by everyone, etc., etc., you know. And then, if you look at the yellow font, it says... One set of explanation lies in external circumstances, in the blah, blah, blah. And then the second paragraph says, another set of explanation lies on blah, 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 internal maybe. So what the writer has done here is they have read maybe, let's say, 10 articles on the causes of loneliness, which is the topic. And while reading them, he or she has realized that, okay, three of them are about in external circumstances, so I cluster them together. And these five are about internal circumstances, cluster them together. And these two are about something else. They are not internal, external, they're something else. So this is called chunking, chunking. And when you are writing the literature review, you don't just make a list of he says this, she says this, he says this, she says this. That is not a literature review. That is just, you know, a descriptive writing. It's just a list of who said what. 
But this person has clustered them according to internal, external circumstances. And that's what is called chunking. So that's another way of being critical and systematic. We've already seen this. This is what a theory is, the definition, right? Tomorrow in our second class, we will be looking at theoretical framework. Tomorrow, not today. Because that is what you will need in your thesis. We will also be looking at something called the conceptual framework. So the conceptual framework is related to the theoretical framework, but it is different. I have a homework for you tomorrow. I have a homework for you tomorrow. So I want, to, I want you to pay your attention here. The homework will be a bit difficult. It will be a bit difficult. It would be challenging. But remember, you can only push yourself through challenging tasks and get an achievement that you can't otherwise think about. If it is too easy, if it is comfortable, if there is no challenge, that doesn't do you good. And that's why I was saying, you know, just helping, helping a student do better doesn't always work. Sometimes it doesn't work. Now, how many of you will be attending my Studium General in the afternoon today? Some of you will be or not? You will? Yeah, or maybe you are already like, we've had enough, too boring, I can't be bothered. So I'll be talking about uh, equity, equality, and some, in fact, I will be showing some of these slides again in the afternoon. So now you know the answer to Taketa Naluma, so please be quiet, don't tell anyone, you know, those who are new in the audience, I'll be talking about that as well. Anyway, so here is your homework. The homework is very simple, but also difficult. It is simple because I am asking you to just write one sentence. How difficult can it be to write one sentence? The homework is just one sentence. So it's very easy, but it is difficult because that one sentence is a rather long sentence, and it has almost everything that you need to have in order to decide on a topic for your scripsy, and the research question, and the methodology, and the findings, and the recommendations. Everything in just one sentence. And most of you haven't even started research. So it is not going to be easy. But it is only one sentence. I would like to challenge you to see some of you at least can do, write this one sentence, bring it to the class, and read it out. And please don't be, you know, like don't feel stressed, don't feel anxious. I want you to feel confident because I'm here for only two days. After tomorrow, I'll disappear. So I want to give you as much as I can. So if I can give you some feedback, six months from now, one year from now, when you start writing your thesis, you will feel more confident. Like, you know, Dr. Rakib gave me some feedback and, you know, this is what, you know, you'll just feel better. So here is the homework. Write one sentence. Everything that you need to know to decide on your research paper is in one sentence. So if you can write it, even if it's difficult, later on you will feel easier. Okay? Just one sentence. And I want some volunteers to read it out tomorrow. I'm not going to force anyone, so don't worry about it. Okay, so that's homework for tomorrow. And thank you very much. I'm on Instagram, so you can add me, and if you have taken photos. So uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, this class, and I'm sure you will all do very well with your research writing. Okay, thank you, Rakib, for the very wonderful presentation for today. And I hope that the presentation from Rakib is really insightful for us, right? And hopefully it's going to help you guys, especially for you are preparing the research uh, paper for the next semester, right? Okay, now 
We still have around 10 minutes. If you have any question, you may share to Dr. Rakib and he will be very welcome. He will be very happy to discuss it with you. And this is going to be the great opportunity for you guys. Okay, let me give you the chance. Raise your hand if you want to have a question. One, one, oh, tiga dulu ya, sebentar. One, two, three, four. Later ya mbak ya, oke. Okay. Let me start from him, oke. Okay. <coughs> uh, mbak, MC, bisa tolong sambil dicatatkan nanti ya pertanyaannya. Oke. Okay. Uh, my name is Daniel Aryo. Uh, my name is Daniel Aryo. I'm currently second year in my study, and my name is. Uh, my, I'm more about asking an opinion rather than a question. Uh, what is your opinion in people making the their research or their thesis with the help of AI. Is it inappropriate or is it fine? Okay, Daniel, so I think that indicates that you are already considering using chat GPT for, <laughs> to make things easier for you, right? Okay, so uh, in Australia at Monash University, it would be seen as an act of plagiarism, um, high-tech plagiarism, because you are using artificial intelligence, which means it's not another human being, but of course it is intelligence in order to do something for you. So it's like a shortcut, right? So the answer is it is unethical and it is almost the same as plagiarism, almost the same, even if you acknowledge it because someone else is helping you. But that's not the point. If you are really serious about studies and if you care about your education and if you want to become a really good researcher in the future, never take shortcuts in life, not just artificial intelligence, but with anything in life, if you go the easier way, what you gain doesn't last. If you go the hard way, the challenging way, if you challenge yourself, it lasts, it gives you more confidence and it is more meaningful. So see it that way, Daniel. It might be possible for you to use AI, and Harry will never find out, maybe. But for you, it wouldn't be good in the long run. It wouldn't be good. Somewhere, you will trip off. And you will trip off realizing that, you know, I took the shortcut, that's why. So that's my answer, right? Yeah. Yang kedua tadi siapa? Hello, Dr. Rokib. My name is Desla Fitria. Uh, I'm from fourth semester. Uh, today, maybe many people want to criticize something, but they are afraid of the consequences. Uh, like when you write a book about government, yes. uh, then it gets banned. How to manage our fear so that we are able to think and express our thought in an era, many things are forced to be taken for granted. Thank you. All right, thank you. Desantewa? Desantewa. Desa, okay. Okay. I think uh, your question indicates that you are brave enough to take up a topic that might be controversial. So what are the consequences? Which is the opposite of Daniel. Daniel wants to take the shortcut and just use chat GPT. So Harry, remember Daniel. When he writes his thesis, be careful. You know. Okay. But Dessa is asking a question which is actually a very good question because she's saying there are certain topics that are controversial. There are certain topics that are sensitive culturally, religiously, politically, etc. So how should I conduct research and what does it mean, etc. Right? So in Australia, again, because Australia is a free country and um, free in terms of intellectual uh, ideas, growing ideas, sharing ideas, but free also in terms of disseminating your ideas. 
freedom of speech, dissemination means not just thinking but sharing with everyone. So in Australia, it is easier. We can say anything. We can even write against our government. We can write against our university. In fact, my PhD thesis was partly critical of Monash University. It was criticizing my own university when I was doing my PhD. Um, so it's not a problem, but you have to accept the cultural, political, social environment where you work and respect it as well. So unless if you don't want to lose your job or something, choose a topic that is not very controversial. And even if it is not controversial, you can still be critical in a respectful way. Why? Because you're saying, I'm being critical because I care about change and I believe we can do better. Not because you know I don't like you or I hate you, but in a constructive spirit. And then when you come to Monash University for a PhD, you can do everything you want, not a problem. Thank you. Yeah. But don't be afraid. That's a, it's a very good spirit, Desa, that you're already thinking, but we have to accept that there might be limitations. It's okay, thank you. Okay, this is, is that answer the question? Okay, thank you. Number three, Oh, number three. Okay, please. You may introduce your name and then. Um, thank you so much, Doctor, for your presentation. My name is Panashen Lovu and um, a communication science major here in UMS. Um, and I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, so my question is on um, unconscious biases. How can we unlearn our um, unconscious biases in a systematic way? Um, and how, how do you know when um, the conclusion that you are reaching at is conscious and free of biases? And um, finally, perhaps when studying a, a, a topic or um, phenomenon, we are mostly inclined towards um, reaching a conclusion, a definite judgment, a yes or um, a no. And it seems as if um, that's usually when um, our biases, what we know, um, and to some extent, our conditioning, that's when it comes in. So um, how can we be free from that, and how can we um, reach sound um, conclusions in our research? Thank you. Thank you very much. That, what a great question. This is a, it's a fantastic question. It is such a good question that even my PhD students uh, keep on thinking about it. Um, and, you know, it's good to have a question from international students. I've never been to Zimbabwe, but I spent five years of my childhood in East Africa. Lovely place. Really want to go back once again. Do you speak Bahasa, by the way? You've picked up some? Um, yeah. All Sit right. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Sedikit, yeah. How long have you been here? I've been here for about a year and um, three weeks now. Okay, yeah. just over one year. And you've done BIPA as well? Yes. I wish I could speak Bahasa like you <laughs> or any other international <laughs> student. Uh, Hassan, you speak Bahasa. I, I heard you speak Bahasa in the morning. Very impressive. <laughs> ah, all right. <laughs> sama, sama. So this was a very good question because um, let me just rephrase what he's asking. So he said unconscious bias. Sometimes we might think we are being critical and objective, but actually we are being shaped by unconscious bias. Unconscious bias means you have a bias that is preventing you from being critical and you don't even know about it. Uh, you know, it could be ethnocentrism, it could be xenophobia cultural relativism, something that is not preventing you. And only when your supervisor reads your writing or your examiner reads your writing, they'll say, no, 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 that is not valid. You can't say that. You're saying that because of such and such, right? Because you are in a male-dominated society, because of patriarchy, because of your heritage, because of whatever it is. So it's a very difficult question to answer and something that we need to be careful about. I've been researching for more than 20 years and still, you know, I, have, I need peer review in order to understand 
whether I'm, you know, I have demonstrated any kind of statement that might possibly indicate an unconscious bias or not. So it is difficult. But there are mechanisms in place that can help us facilitate the reduction of biases. So, for example, if you do a quantitative study, there is the question of reliability and validity. Validity, reliability. These are mechanical processes that would ensure that biases are minimized, but maybe not eliminated. Maybe it can't be bias-free completely, unless it's in natural sciences. In social sciences, it can't be 100% bias-free. So we have validity, reliability for quantitative studies. For qualitative studies, we have credibility, transferability, um, trustworthiness. And then we have other mechanisms of data collection itself, such as triangulation, where you're getting the same kind of data using two different methods. So you're triangulating to make sure that you're not biased, but you have more evidence to come to a conclusion. So we have this you know, validity, reliability, triangulation, transferability, et cetera, et cetera. We have triangulation, we have other things in control, but on top of all of these things, we can further enhance our criticality and try to minimize our biases by simply being open about our thinking. So as you saw in my profile slide, one of the methodologies that I'm familiar with is autoethnography and critical ethnography. Now, autoethnography is a kind of research method, we'll talk about it in tomorrow's class actually, where you not only consider yourself as a participant alongside your designated participants, but you are actually allowed to talk about your biases, prejudices, and your thinking explicitly as part of the data analysis. So instead of pretending like, you know, I am neutral, I don't have any biases, if you talk about it, if you reflect on it, it makes the reader better understand if you may still have biases. So I, I guess that are, these are some of the ways, but in the end, 100%, you can't say I'm bias-free. And we never tell our students to say that you are objective, because in constructivist sciences, in interpretivist tradition, it is not even a good thing to say I'm 100% objective. Because you, you remember my classroom photo? Each people will see it differently. They will not see it in the same way. And the reason why everyone will see it differently is because not necessarily of our biases, but because of our cultural, historical, linguistic configuration. So, but it's a good thing to be conscious of. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Mr. Rakib, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Muhammad Riza Punjabi, and I will talk. Uh, no, I want to ask about your presentation earlier. So, the main point of the research is uh, to do uh, no to see a problem in. The so, so uh, let me go in first. Don't forget that. So the main problem of the research is we need to see a problem with a different view. So if there is something that uh, we usually taking for granted, uh, we need to see a different way to uh, see that the, the problem is. So, so the purpose of the thesis or like a script is to re renew the knowledge. So my question is, what if the most of people doesn't agree with us, and even though we have enough, enough evidence of it? So is it our research is going to be wasteful, or is going to be nothing? That's it, my question. Thank you. Thank you. That's another good question. So there is something called falsifiability. I can put it on the, the whiteboard, but you won't be able to see it, so it's okay. Falsifiability, it's called falsifiability. Social sciences research, like you know, English language education or literature or teacher education, is built on falsifiability, which means that no matter what your findings are and no matter how convincing they are, it is possible to falsify them or to dispute them 
or to say I don't agree, unlike natural sciences, and that is okay. So not everyone has to agree with you. So when you report your findings in your thesis, you provide enough evidence to say, I am saying this because I have this evidence. And according to previous studies, this indicates that this is the truth. So you're making connections to previous studies, theories, basing it on your own findings, answering the research question. So there is evidence for it. But there is a fluidity in social sciences, fluidity, which means it's not 100% objective. It's constructivist, right? Your own you know, interpretation comes in. It's not 100%. So it is not possible to write a thesis or a research paper where 100% of people will agree with you. All you care is your supervisor and your examiner to agree with you. You don't care about anyone else, right? It's true, but there is no need to convince everyone. Secondly, in the conclusion of your research, you also talk about some limitations. So in the conclusion, normally you talk about some of the methodological and theoretical limitations, saying, I know I could do this, but I couldn't do it. I know it is not 100%, you know, because of such and such, I had certain issues, certain limitations, methodological, theoretical limitation, etc. So acknowledging the limitations will soften the blow. It will soften, it would say, all right, I'm not saying it's 100% true. I'm saying there are limitations. And based on the limitations, at the end of your conclusion, you're giving some recommendations for future studies. Like, I couldn't do this or my study didn't get enough evidence of this. Therefore, I recommend future researchers to do this recommendation. So when you, when you do all of this, you know, limitations, recommendations, all of that, it's okay. It doesn't have to be 100% agreeable by everyone, right? It's fine, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think it's enough, yeah, for the another question. Maybe we can share to Dr. Rakib later on because yeah, it's already done. So once more, give applause to Dr. Rakib for this wonderful presentation. I have a um, studio general in the afternoon and another class tomorrow. Another class tomorrow. Yes, sir. Is it compulsory? Sure, sure. Oh, thank God. Otherwise, no one will turn up. Okay. It's been boring. Sure. Okay, don't forget. Adi, Adi, don't forget. After this, we are going to have a break. We will have another session with Dr. Cho with Dr. Rakib today at 1 o'clock in the afternoons and then so please after this you may have a break solat bisa di mana di lantai berapa ya yeah, lantai tiga ya yeah. you can have prayer in the third floor and then after that you may come back here and don't worry we are going to have the what is that the other things that you can do for what is that for satisfying your hunger don't worry about that ya yeah. okay now i think that's all for today's uh, for uh, sorry for today, for this session and i'll see you again at one o'clock after the break okay thank you so much rakib we'll see you again uh, at one o'clock and tomorrow morning also don't forget yeah uh thank you for me uh wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh i'll give it to the mc for the closing thank you so much Thank you for Dr. Akib Chaudhary for the insightful lecture. The last agenda is closing. Let's close our agenda by saying Hamdalah together. <laughs> Zero to hero, the close statement is if you want to research, you have to critical thinking, after that critical reading and critical writing. No matter who you are, where you from, your skin color, your gender identity, we are same, we can reach our dream together until Monash University. I'm Amelia Rizky Dian Pramukti. If I, if I made a mistake, I say sorry. And then for your attention, I say gracias, merci moku, shay shay, arigato gozaimas, kamsa amida, shukron, thank you, and terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. After that, any another presentation regarding language, curriculum, and culture at 1 p.m.